Here's the basic circuit for this lab. I've got my homemade inductor that I wound myself. I've got a resistor here and a capacitor here. So this is an LRC circuit in series and it's going to have a resonance at a certain frequency which is determined by the L and C values and then that resonance is going to have a certain width and strength to it which will be partially determined by the resistor and also secondarily by the other components but the bigger the resistor is the, the wider the resonance will be the smaller the response will be at resonance and the lower the Q of the resonance will be. I made my inductor with 2,000, I'm sorry, 200 turns of wire uh, wound around a toilet paper roll. And so I have a rough estimate of what this thing's inductance is going to be, but uh, that's only a rough approximation, uh, partly because it's not a long inductor. So there is no uh, simple formula that will accurately tell you the inductance of a, a short solenoid like this. So uh, part of the idea of this lab is that whatever inductor you've made, uh, you can measure the resonant frequency. Since the resonant frequency connects to L and C, you can use it to find out the unknown L. And your exact design is going to depend somewhat on uh, your inductor and your estimate of what you think its inductance will be. Um, but just to give you a rough idea, uh, for my design, I came up with about uh, 47 ohms for the resistor and uh, 47 nanofarads for the capacitor. 47 just happens to be one of those uh, standard values for components. And uh, the way I arrived at those values was that I picked a reasonable resonant frequency that I knew uh, I would be able to produce. So that determined uh, C given L my estimate L. And then for the resistor, uh, I uh, chose a value that gave me a Q of about 5. So I wanted a strong enough resonance that I would get a pretty clear measurement of what the resonant frequency was, but not uh, such a narrow resonance that I would have a hard time locating the resonance. Now obviously this circuit has no uh, power source. It's not going to do anything or oscillate when it's just sitting there. So over here is where we have the thing that's going to uh, provide the driving for this circuit. Um, since we don't have an actual sine wave generator uh, that's included in part of our kits that wouldn't fit within our budget, uh, I'm using the calibration output of this Hontech oscilloscope, which is that little clip right there. And uh, this is not at all the purpose of that calibration output. That calibration output has to do with tuning up the characteristics of the probe for a particular application at a certain frequency. Uh, but it does put out uh, an oscillating, an AC uh, waveform, which uh, we can use to, to drive our circuit. And uh, then to connect onto it, it's just this little uh, tongue sticking out here with a hole in it. The idea would normally be that when you're calibrating the oscilloscope probe, you would take the mini grabber right here on the oscilloscope probe and connect it to that tongue, and it would be very convenient. However, for our setup for this lab, you can't really do that. So instead, uh, I had to rig up some other way to connect. So I found a paper clip. Uh, this paper clip. I don't know if you can see, it has uh, some plastic on it, which I guess is just meant to make it, I don't know, more grabby or something. Uh, but that, that transparent white stuff you see uh, around the wire is insulation. So that was convenient for me. I was able to strip off the insulation off the ends with uh, a pair of wire strippers. And so I made a little hook, hooked it over the calibration output of the scope. Um, I put a strip of this stylish uh, plaid duct tape on just to make sure that I would have total insulation from these logic outputs even though this part of the paper clip is supposed to be uh, insulated. Lay the paper clip in there, put another strip of uh, duct tape on top to keep it all in place and then I had uh, something accessible where I could clip 
an alligator clip onto it. So this is the whole driving circuit and it's in fact a whole separate circuit basically from the LRC circuit whose resonance we're looking at. Uh, and it has some advantages to isolate those two circuits from each other. So the idea is that we use the magnetic field from this coil to drive this coil. So they're coupled together through magnetic fields. Uh, it's uh, basically a transformer. So on this, uh, on this side, this is, this is the primary circuit, would be the terminology for a transformer. Uh, I go from the output of the signal generator through my other coil, which is uh, 200 turns wound around this little PVC pipe, slightly smaller diameter than the other coil. Um, then I come out here and I go through the ground clip of this, the, the scope's probe because I need to make a complete circuit and I need to make that circuit go back to ground. So at the input, chan the channel one input of the scope, that's, that's my return line for getting current back through the scope. And it's kind of a weird thing to do to send any significant amount of current uh, through there. These, these ground connections on the scope are not meant to be current carrying leads, but it's a relatively small amount of current, so it works. Um, so the idea is that, like on channel two, which isn't connected up right now, you can see the outside connector on, uh, on channel two. That's at ground, and it's connected to the ground of the whole USB interface of my computer. Um, if you step back and take a look at this circuit, it's basically kind of a dead short, which would generally be a stupid thing to do, to connect up a dead short to the output of your device. You, you would, by all rights, expect this to just destroy itself. Uh, so I just have wire, 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 wire. And so that you would think would be the definition of a short. Uh, there's a little bit of resistance in this wire, uh, about four ohms, I think I measured on the uh, ohm meter, uh, but basically it's a short. Well, uh, at first I was really afraid to try anything like this and I tried all kinds of precautions like putting in an extra resistor to limit the current. Uh, but then after fiddling with, around with the scope for a while, uh, I, I ended up figuring out that there, there's a resistor inside the box in here which is a, uh, a few hundred uh, ohms. And clearly its purpose is to protect the scope from a short. And therefore, uh, the good news is that it, it can't destroy itself the way you'd expect a short to normally destroy a piece of equipment like this when you put a dead short across it. Uh, the bad news is that it uh, limits us to pretty low current in this primary driving circuit. Uh, so we just have to be careful to uh, optimize everything to get our signal as strong as possible because of the low amount of current we can get out. So if I now scoot my coil of my LRC circuit over close to that one, what should be happening right now is that uh, this coil is creating an oscillating magnetic field. Whenever you have a changing magnetic field, that induces a curly electric field, and that curly electric field is going to be sensed by this coil. So the physics of that is very similar to the earlier lab you did where you uh, waved a bar magnet around uh, in the vicinity of the receiving coil. Uh, so we're using this to drive the secondary coil. And that, I believe right now, is causing the LRC circuit to respond with electrical oscillations. I'm just not set up yet to measure that oscillation. So the advantage of having these as two totally separate circuits would be that I have an air gap in there. And that's discussed at great length in the lab manual because I don't want you to burn out your precious oscilloscope. The idea is that if you are not careful about how you hook things up, you can easily uh, short out your scope in, in bad ways. Um, so uh, what I would normally do is I would use these two probes, these two connections on the, on the oscilloscope probe, the ground clip and the mini grabber, and I would just connect wherever I felt like on here and measure some voltage difference across one of these components. Uh, so you can see already that's a problem because I've already got uh, this ground clip connection in use as part of the circuit here, which is actually a current carrying uh, part of the circuit. Uh, and then the other issue would be that if I'm not careful, 
how I connect these two things onto here, I can end up with a, uh, a high voltage or a significant voltage output of the scope shorting to ground, and then that's going to that's gonna cause bad things to happen. So ideally what I really like would be I would have a function generator over here driving this, and then I would have a whole separate oscilloscope measuring a voltage off of this, and I wouldn't have any of these issues with connecting the wrong thing to the wrong thing and getting a short to ground. But, but because we're on a very tight budget during the COVID-19 quarantines, we didn't have enough of a budget to buy uh, two different instruments, a, a function generator that would generate the sine wave and drive everything, and a separate oscilloscope. So uh, that makes it a little bit harder. And uh, so because of that, uh, we're going to um, have to be careful about how we hook this up to this. So what I want to do is hook up my oscilloscope uh, to measure the voltage across one of these components. Uh, they all have oscillating voltages across them, so uh, in principle any one of them would work. However, if you work out the math, uh, it turns out that there's a fairly big voltage across the capacitor, fairly big voltage across the inductor, and the voltage across the resistor is considerably smaller. Uh, it turns out that if, you, if the Q of the circuit is 5, Basically, the voltage across uh, these elements is about five times bigger than that. So to get a nice big signal that's easy to measure, one of the things I want to do is measure the voltage across one of these components, not that. So I'm going to measure the voltage across the capacitor. So to measure a voltage difference, I need to connect both of these parts of the scope's probe to somewhere in the circuit. And so first I'm going to start with the ground, which is this ground clip right here. And I want to think before I do that, a very, very common mistake with this kind of stuff is not to think about where you're connecting the ground to. And of course the lab manual does go into that in extreme detail. Um, but right now, this whole circuit is just floating. It's just sitting on top of the wood on my desk. So nothing in here is connected to any high voltage, uh, or any, any significant voltage directly. So I'm safe kind of connecting this onto anywhere I want. I'm going to pick this side of the capacitor. And that means that I want the other probe of the scope to be connected to the other side of the capacitor. And if you look carefully at the circuit diagram, you can verify that that does not give any easy way for current to flow from the, this probe uh, to ground or from any other thing to ground. Nothing is connected directly to ground, so it's not a short. So to get a connection on here, it's kind of awkward. I've got to take this mini grabber connection, clip it like that onto the little thumb lever on the alligator clip, and then I'm going to connect that to the other side. Of the capacitor. And this is known as the smoke test. I don't see any smoke coming out, so I think I'm right. I didn't get it short. So this is good. So now I am getting a nice uh, strong signal on, on the scope that's easy to measure. Uh, that took a little bit of luck and planning. So when you first hook this up, you may not get a big strong signal like this. You might not get any, any noticeable uh, signal at all. The reason I'm getting a big signal here is because of several things I did to optimize. First of all, uh, I estimated as best I could the inductance of that coil, which was a homework problem, and chose this capacitance to be the right value that I thought would work. Uh, I've in fact done this experiment twice now, so the first time around was when I verified this capacitance really was right, so I'm not com completely flying blind. Um, so that helps because I'm right on resonance and I already knew what capacitance to use to here to get on resonance. Uh, when you do it, just like me, you're not going to be totally sure yet. You may need to play with this capacitance value a little bit to get close enough to resonance to see anything. Uh, so don't freak out if you see nothing. Uh, the other thing that helped a lot, uh, the first time I did this I used different coils and I got a much smaller response. So I actually used uh, this coil right here the first time around, it's 54 
coils of wire wound around a Starbucks cup. Um, and it just turns out that, not surprisingly, a coil with 150 turns of wire is a lot better than a coil with uh, 50 turns. Uh, the actual physical size of this doesn't matter a heck of a lot, so I, I made it physically small uh, to make it easier to work with and save on wire. So, um, and I also have a nice big coil over here with uh, 200 turns. So those three things will all help you to get a nice strong signal. Um, picking the right capacitance by calculating it carefully and then doing a little bit of trial and error if necessary. Big number of turns, big number of turns. Sometimes it's possible to pick up a, uh, something on the scope that's just kind of noise or interference and fool yourself into thinking you're seeing the big signal, the right signal. So uh, I'm just going to verify that that's real. So I've got this much air between the two coils right now. It's about half an inch. If I do this, let's watch the scope. In fact, this, the triggering cut off. Let's try again. I'll scoot the triggering down. Or just There we go. It's a, it's a really small signal. I'll put the triggering, triggering on auto now. So this is another thing that could happen to you. If you're not getting much of a signal, then having it trigger in normal triggering mode, you just might not get any trigger because there's no signal. So now I'm on auto triggering, and when I'm far apart, I get very little signal. And then if you watch the screen, you'll see that as I move it closer, it gets a lot stronger. So that helps to reassure me that I really am seeing the signal that I think I'm seeing. And I'm going to try to show you how I did the uh, actual practical measurement of, of the amplitude here. So I wanted to measure this amplitude uh, when I changed the capacitance and uh, figure out which capacitance was optimizing that amplitude because then I would know that I was really at the resonance. So to do that I need a numerical value for the, uh, the amplitude of the wave. Uh, the classic way to do that on an oscilloscope would just be to measure that. So I would count how many divisions, and it looks like it's going from about uh, minus 1.6 up to plus 2.2. Um, and I would use that as my measure of amplitude. Actually, because this thing is computer software, it has some features in that that make that a little bit less work. Um, so I'm going to dim the screen a little bit here so you can see the stuff that's too bright. I now uh, go down and look at this stuff at the bottom of the screen. This is in the Open Hontech 6022 software. Might look a little different if you're using different software. Uh, there's a bunch of text in there and it's all kind of crowded together. So I actually had to grow the window on the screen like that. And now you can see all those little text things separately. And so I think the one that I found pretty pretty easy to uh, to read and it was pretty consistent was the um, either this one which is labeled MV RMS or this one which says MV with a tilde after it indicating AC uh, this would be the root mean square value of, of the voltage uh, this uh, is some other measure of amplitude I'm not sure how, how different they are it doesn't matter that much as long as you're getting a, uh, a consistent way of measuring the amplitude as a function of frequency I want to show you a phenomenon that confused me a little bit the first time I did this experiment with this setup. Uh, so this is a digital oscilloscope we're using. Uh, so it provides this illusion that this is a beautiful mathematical sine wave, but really this thing is uh, a computer input from an analog to digital converter. So really those are integers that it's measuring, and it's just because the integers are pretty big that we get something that looks like a smooth sine wave. But this is the big signal, okay. Uh, when you first set up your experiment, you may see a very small signal or almost no signal at all because you haven't yet figured out quite the right capacitance to put in to, to find your resonance. So I'm going to intentionally produce that and show you what that looks like because this is a digital input. So I'm going to intentionally move this far away. I'm on normal triggering, so I'm not getting any triggering now. I'll switch to auto triggering. And now you get what looks from a distance kind of like random noise. And if I bring the camera in close, 
I think you can probably see that that noise is kind of quantized. So what I mean by that is that there are certain discrete signal levels, like uh, that level, that level, that level, and that level. So that's evidence that this thing is uh, actually a computer input that's an integer. Uh, I believe each unit is like 4 millivolts. Now let me show you what that looks like when I move the magnets a little closer. So I get a little bit more of a signal. You can see a little bit of a signal coming in there now, right? Not very strong, but uh, you can see that there is an oscillation, oscillating sine wave. Um, I probably can't trigger on it cleanly uh, because it's so messy. And you need to understand why it's so messy. So the reason it's so messy is because of that quantization. It's because these are integers. Um, so I originally thought it was some kind of interference or something. I didn't understand. I finally realized, no, that's just because it's a digital oscilloscope. Finally, I'll try to show you an example of uh, changing the capacitance in order to uh, figure out uh, how to tune in the, uh, the resonance. So uh, right now I've got that much amplitude, which, depend, which is an indication of how close I am to resonance. If I'm off resonance, maybe that's not as much as I could get. Maybe I could get more by putting in the correct capacitance. And so here's the capacitor down here. And so that's actually a 47 nanofarad capacitor. And then right here, I have a 33 nanofarad capacitor, which is another sort of reasonable value that I had available that I thought might, might work. And so I could actually just swap this in, so open up these two alligator clips, put in the other value. Actually, an even easier way to do it right now is this. I've got 47 nanofarads there, and then in my fingers I've got a 33 nanofarad capacitor. If I just touch it like this, it'll be in parallel with the other capacitor. Capacitances in parallel are going to add, so I should get 47 plus 33, which I guess would be 80 nanofarads. So that would be a big change in the capacitance way, way off compared to what I think I should have. So it should take me quite a bit off resonance. So let's see if that actually works. So you can see the scope now, and I'm going to go ahead and touch that. And you see the response go way down. So there's with the extra capacitor in there in parallel. You can see I'm not making a very reliable connection. Here we go. And then taking it out, putting it in, and taking it out. So this is not necessarily the best technique for making a good reliable connection. Uh, but it does sort of work. And you can do small values like this. So you could put in a 10 nanofarad capacitor in there just to increase the capacitance a little bit. Uh, you can also put in a second capacitor in series if you have to. That's just more work, right? Because there's no way to do that without breaking a connection and then putting the second capacitor in with another piece of wire.